What's up guys, hope you're having a good day. Last weekend was our biggest winning weekend of the year in live betting. We banked a profit of 5.35 units in a single night. So to celebrate, I'm giving away a lot of free trials to my live betting service this weekend. So if you're interested, if you want to give it a try, email me info at mmabettingtips.com. I'll leave the email address in the description below if you'd like to get a free trial to my live betting service to see what all the fuss is about send me an email we'll get you set up won't cost you anything i think you'll love it as you can see over the last eight years we've just consistently grinded out profits barely ever had a losing quarter made a profit most months and live betting ufc is my absolute speciality it's what i do best it's my bread and butter so get in touch if you're interested email address in the description below we'll get you set up in time for saturday i'm sure you will love it but in this video we are going to be breaking down all of the main card fights from UFC Fight Night. Sean Strickland versus Abus and Magomedov. It's a brilliant card. Six interesting fights for us to dig into. And as ever, if you like my breakdowns, if you like my analysis, and you want to watch breakdown videos for all the prelim fights on this card, head on over to my website, MMABettingTips.com, where you will find breakdown videos for every single fight on every single UFC card. But if you email me for a free trial to gain access to UFC live betting, you'll also gain access to all my breakdown videos for this card because, well, it comes with everything, right? You get the live betting membership, get access to all my pre-fight bets, which are performing extremely well this year, uh, live bets, which have always performed well, all my breakdown videos, which will save you having to research the fights yourself. You can use them as kind of a strategy guide or, uh, you know, maybe just... Maybe just something you can watch to give you a heads up on uh, on things you may want to take a closer look at in your own research. So anyway, I don't know why I'm going blurry. Let's see if we can correct that. That's a little bit better. Uh, let's kick things off by starting to break down the first fight on this card. Let's break down the fight between Sean Strickland and Abus and Magomedov. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of his name. I do apologize. Whenever I whenever I butcher the pronunciation of someone's name, uh, they always correct people always correct me in the comments. So correct me in the comments if I'm you know pronouncing that correctly. And don't forget to hit the like button as well. If you like these videos, uh, by hitting the like button, you help me out a lot because they push the videos to way more people. I'd love to get my views up. Love to get more people seeing these videos. So you'd be helping me out a lot if you could hit the like button. So yeah, let's get into it. Uh, Magomedov versus Strickland. Very strange main event this. Uh, Magomedov has been fast-tracked into a main event in the UFC. I don't really know why. Uh, it's not like he's a charismatic character that the fans love, like a Paddy Pimler or a Conor McGregor. Uh, it's not like he has a particularly exciting style of fighting either, and he definitely hasn't worked his way up in the promotion because he's only had one fight in the UFC so this is a very very strange main event for me um, and yeah it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense but doesn't matter let's just get into the odds and we will see how these two match up from a betting point of view and as ever remember these breakdown videos are coming from a betting point of view so if we scroll down, we can see that Sean Strickland is the favourite at average odds of around 1.68, which is going to be minus 147 for an implied probability of 60%. We take a look at the odds on Magomedov. He's around an average of 2.20, which is going to be plus 120 for an implied probability of 45%. So Strickland is 32 years old, 6 foot 1 with a 76 inch reach. And Magomedov is 32 years old, 6 foot 2 with a 78 inch reach. So as you can see, both guys roughly the same, you know, roughly the same size the same age nothing too notable in terms of x factors apart from this of course uh, being uh, magomedov's first main event in the ufc hasn't gone five hard rounds before with anyone near the level of sean strickland so this is a big step up in competition for him even though they do have roughly the same number of fights now this is a really difficult fight from a betting point of view because even though magomedov has had loads of fights you know, 30 pro fights is a lot. With the way that his matchups have kind of played out over the last few years, we don't really know a lot about him. 
If we take a look at his record, we can see that he has only fought once in the last three years. And that fight only lasted 19 seconds. So the Stolfus fight really doesn't tell us anything about him. Then, these three fights all ended pretty quickly. You know, 33 seconds, 47 seconds... Um, you know, this one lasts a little bit longer, but still relatively quickly. And so the last time that we got a good look at Magomedov was five years ago, all the way back in 2018. His fights, you know, in the last five years really don't tell us very much about him. So when we're forming opinions based on Magomedov's strengths and weaknesses, it's based on fights that took place a really long time ago. And the problem with that is we don't know how much he's improved in that time. And we don't know, you know, if he's got a lot better or if he's got a lot worse. Now, logically speaking, you know, you'd think that he would have got better in the last five years, right? Because he's only 32 years old, you know, very young for a middleweight. You would expect him to be making big improvements from fight to fight. So the logical way to look at this would be, you know, if we go back and watch his fights from back in 2018 that went to a decision, you know, fights that we got a really good look at, you know, Magomedov in, he can't be any worse than that. You know, he must have got a lot better in the last five years. But then another way to look at it is outside of the UFC, there's basically no drug testing in MMA. I mean, if you hear a Chael Sonnen talk about the drug testing before USADA came in and in promotions that don't have USADA, Chael Sonnen basically compares drug testing in MMA to an IQ test, essentially saying, if you're smart, you could kind of cheat the system pretty easily. And so, you know, obviously I'm not accusing Magomedov of anything specifically, but we haven't seen how he looks, you know, in a hard competitive fight over three rounds, let alone five rounds. Um, you know, w w w you know, in a, in a promotion with very, very strict drug testing. And that's not even to say that Magomedov may be using performance enhancing drugs, but there are so many more things that come, you know, with USADA drug testing in the UFC, right? You can't use an IV to rehydrate after a weight cut. So, you know, if Magomedov is one of these guys that has a tough weight cut, depletes his body a lot. You know, when he uses IVs to rehydrate, well, he can't do that in the UFC. So he might look a lot worse in the UFC than he has in the past. There might be certain supplements he used to take, which he can't any longer. You know, certain medications, perhaps, that he takes, which he's not able to use any longer. So, yeah, Magomedov is a bit of an unknown. I mean, based on past performances, what I can tell you is his striking's reasonably good. Nothing special. Doesn't appear to have too much power in his hands. Moves reasonably well. Uh, but he likes to grapple a lot more than he likes to strike. And the problem with assessing his level of grappling in his past fights is that he hasn't really faced any resistance. The kind of guys that he's been facing have given up takedowns very easily. They haven't done a particularly good job of making him work hard for takedowns. And then once on the ground, um, they've made life very, very easy for him. He's been able to control them and kind of grind them out relatively easily. So even though Magomedov's grappling looks reasonably good, we don't know how he's going to look against someone like Sean Strickland, who obviously has much better takedown offense and a much better ground game than a lot of his, you know, of, of the guys that Magomedov's faced in the past. So Magomedov is a guy that I'm struggling to read. Where this fight does get interesting, though, is that Sean Strickland is very predictable. You know, there's a lot of things I love about Strickland and a lot of things that he does really well, which makes him a very difficult stylistic opponent for most guys in the division. Because, you know, when you have a guy like Sean Strickland, who has the toughness and the cardio to just keep coming forward and pressuring you and making you work and throwing a really high volume of strikes, it's a difficult style to deal with because there's no breaks in there with Strickland. You know, there's no taking a minute or two off here or there kind of catch your breath and pace yourself you know, he's difficult to take down and hold down you know Strickland is the kind of guy that is going to walk you down get in your face and force you to engage for the full 15 to 25 minutes right and he's not going to get tired and while he doesn't have a whole lot of power in his hands he does throw a high volume of strikes and 
you know, he's got a style which weighs you down, you know, that pressure is draining. And, you know, that's difficult to train for because, you know, to go hard, as hard as Strickland makes you go for 25 minutes, it's not an easy thing to do for a man that weighs 186 pounds, you know. This isn't the flyweight division. The pace that Strickland fights at is unsustainable for many. And it was Strickland's pace that got him over the line against, you know, Nazardine Imovov in his last fight, right? Strickland took that fight on short notice and still Imovov couldn't keep up with the pace that he sets. So will Magomedov be able to keep up with the pace that he sets? I mean, we don't know. But it has been a long time since he went to a decision and he doesn't have, I mean, any experience really going the distance against, you know, a, a very high level middleweight, you know, in, in someone like Sean Strickland. But Strickland's downfall is that he is very predictable. And... You know, when you face Sean Strickland, there's really no surprises because he doesn't mix things up. He doesn't really throw many kicks. He's not going to try and take you down. You know, he's going to walk, you know, stalk you around the octagon, pressuring you, trying to, you know, force you into fighting in a phone booth and, and exchanging with him in boxing range. But that's pretty much all you need to worry about. And while that is a very formidable threat that is difficult to deal with, at least there's no surprises. You know, when you face Sean Strickland, you know exactly what to expect. And that makes him relatively easy to game plan for. Like, if Magomedov is a smart guy, which I'm sure he is, he will have looked at footage on Strickland and he'll know exactly what to expect. And that makes it a lot easier for Magomedov to formulate a game plan, a strategy, and pace himself, right? Control his heart rate, control his breathing, not panic, because when he's in there, there's no surprises that are going to, you know, cause him to adrenaline dump or, or, or panic or get stressed out. Don't get me wrong, he's still going to get panic and stressed out, but it's not like Strickland's going to show up and do anything that he, that he couldn't have prepared for. And so, you know, it's an interesting matchup from a betting point of view because, you know, when you look at Magomedov's past fights, there's nothing wrong with his skill set. He's a well-rounded fighter, reasonably good everywhere. But this is a big step up in competition for him now. And I just don't feel the footage that we've got on him in the last few years gives us, I mean, any kind of idea really how he's going to look against Strickland this weekend. So for me, this is a very difficult fight to bet. I mean, let me know what you think in the comments, um, you know, how you see this one playing out. I mean, if you've, if you've got more... Um, if you've got like better information on, on Magomedov's uh, capabilities compared to what I've been able to share with you, please let me know. But this is a guy where I'm very, very much struggling to assess his uh, skill level. So if we take a look at the over-under on this one, um, oh, just, just to cap off the money line, um, I'm not going to be betting this fight myself because I really don't know uh, what to expect from uh, Magomedov. But if I were to bet this fight, gun to my head, uh, I would obviously take... Sorry, I'm going blurry and I'm trying to fix it. Uh, I would obviously take Sean Strickland just because, from my perspective, he's more experienced. You know exactly what you're getting from him. He's very consistent. You know he, you know he can go five hard rounds. So I just prefer to have my money on Strickland than Magomedov, but I'm not going to be betting this fight. Too many unanswered questions for me. Um, and again, because of the unanswered questions, very difficult to know whether this fight is likely to go to a decision or not. Obviously, Strickland is a bit of a decisionator. You look at his record, most of his fights go to a decision. But Magomedov doesn't have a lot of experience uh, going to a decision. And so, you know, maybe he doesn't have the gas tank to go 25 hard minutes. Maybe he gasses out very bad, which obviously would increase the probability for the fight ending inside the distance. So, very, very difficult to pull the trigger uh, on that one. Either way, without knowing more about Magomedov, it is very tough. And exactly the same for props. Without knowing more about Magomedov, very, very difficult to uh, to feel confident in any prop. Because we just don't really know what to expect from him. So I hope you found that useful. Just going to have a quick drink. Okay. All right. Now let's break down the fight between Damir Ismagulov and Grant Dawson. And as many of you guys will know, 
over the last year, I have basically completely overhauled my pre-fight betting strategy. I'm going to make a specific video on exactly the steps I took to do this. But if we look at our pre-fight betting results, you can see that you can basically split the our pre-fight betting results over the last three years into different categories, right? You've got this huge explosive run up here. Then you've got a year where we basically break even. And then in the last year, we've got another explosive run up. We don't have, in terms of numbers, the sizable profits we made there, but definitely a nice, steady, consistent uptrend. And what I basically did was when we suffered this really nasty losing month here about a year ago, I sat down and I was like, something's not working, right? I've gone from absolutely crushing it, you know, with this huge uptrend here, to just floating around break even. What's happened? Like, what am I doing wrong? How can I how can I improve? So what I basically did was go through all my bets throughout this period of time. And I identified the kind of bets that were consistently costing me money. The kind of bets which I was performing really well on. And I basically eliminated, just stopped placing bets on the kind of things that were consistently costing me money. Doubled down on the kind of bets that were making me money. And... Uh, you can see the results here. We've absolutely crushed it over the last year. Where if you just take this area from where I made the changes and we just cut that out, bring it into Photoshop, you can see that we've got a really nice uptrend now. Steady, consistent profits almost every month over the last year. And I'm mentioning this because... Damir Ismagulov fits the profile of a bet that we perform really well on. So, obviously, you know, you never really know what's going to happen in a fight, right? All you could do is, you know, spend time researching the fight, identifying good value bets, putting your money in strong positions, and then hopefully it pays off and you win the bet. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in this fight between Isma Gulov and Grant Dawson. But based on past performances, Damir Isma Gulov is an absolute nightmare for Grant Dawson. And if both these guys show up and perform like they usually do, which I'm optimistic they will because Isma Gulov is very consistent, then I see him giving Grant Dawson absolute hell. And that's interesting because whenever you've got a fight such as this where the research kind of shows that one guy has a huge advantage over the other, you'd expect the guy with a huge advantage to be a big favourite, right? And what's interesting about the Ismagulov versus Dawson fight is that, as you can see, Ismagulov did open up as a reasonably big favourite. And then the public have started to bet on Dawson which has moved the odds into the even money odds range. And as we can see from the green arrows pointing up, Isma Gulov's odds continue to improve while Dawson's odds continue to decline. So God knows uh, what Isma Gulov's odds are going to be come the time the fight starts. But this is nothing new to us, right? Because, you know, if you look at our results, you know, recent results, um, the majority of our bets are either... You know, in the underdog odds range or even money, right? You know, we bet on Randy Brown as a big favourite last week. But then you've got, you know, big underdog there, big underdog there, even money, even money, even money, even money, even money. Next page. Uh, you know, relatively big favourite there, but then big underdog, big favourite, even money, moderate favourite, even money, reasonably big favourite, even money, even money, and then... Uh, reasonably big favorite but the point being a decent percentage of our bets are either underdogs or in the even money odds range and we're very very good i feel one of our big edges when it comes to betting is why did i close that down uh, one of our big edges when it comes to betting is correctly interpreting fights that the majority of people do not correctly interpret and I think that's what's going on here. And I think it's what's happened 
you know, in some of our recent bets where we bet on fighters like uh, Jazz Duvicius, who absolutely dominated Miranda Maverick, or Chase Hooper, who absolutely dominated Fury, or, you know, Liz Boa, who dominated Jess Rose Clark, Bailon Mohammed dominated Gilbert Burns, right? We're very good at seeing things that others do not see and digging into the detail. And I think that's what's going on here. Um, because to the naked eye, when you look at Damir Ismagulov's last fight against Armin Tazrukian, you'll see Tazrukian having a decent amount of success with his grappling and kind of wet blanketing Ismagulov to a decision win. Then if you go look at Grant Dawson's recent fights, you'll notice him putting on a grappling clinic against both Jared Gordon and Matt Madsen and, you know, some of his past opponents as well, Leonardo Santos, for example. So to the naked eye, when you look at Dawson's recent fights, Isma Gulov's recent fights, this looks like a really tough fight for Isma Gulov because Dawson's looked like an absolute beast on the ground and Isma Gulov was basically out grappled by Taz Rukian. But the devil is in the detail. And where people are misinterpreting this fight and not reading it correctly is that they don't understand how much of a better grappler Taz Rukian is than Dawson. Taz Rukian is levels and levels and levels and levels above Grant Dawson. In the lightweight division, when it comes to grappling, you've literally got, if you take Volk out of the equation, if we're not counting Volk as a, a lightweight, if you just focus on like proper lightweights, proper lightweights, right? Guys in the lightweight division, right? Volk is uh, obviously primarily a featherweight, right? If we just focus on the guys in the lightweight division. Tazrukian and Makachev are in a league of their own with their grappling. And then there's everyone else miles behind them. Dawson is nowhere near the level of grappler that Armin Tazrukian is. And so just because Tazrukian was able to outgrapple Isma Gulov doesn't mean Dawson will. And what's interesting about this fight is that even though Tazrukian was able to outgrapple Isma Gulov, Isma Gulov's defensive wrestling in that fight showed us that he's very likely to give Grant Dawson absolute hell. So, if we break this fight down in each area that it could take place, and I'm also going to show you a little bit of footage to show what I mean um, with, with both Isma Gulov's strengths and Dawson's weaknesses. But basically, this fight is going to come down to whether or not Dawson can get this fight to the ground and keep this fight on the ground. Because I think we're all in agreement. Please let me know in the comments if you disagree. But I think most of us are in agreement that if this fight stays standing, Grant Dawson will get absolutely smoked. He has no striking. He's very sloppy, very bad defensively. And Isma Gulov is a very technical striker. He moves well. He's good defensively. Throws a nice diverse range of strikes. A good volume. If the fight stays standing, Isma Gulov should absolutely dominate. This will not be a contest. In order for Dawson to win this fight, he has to get this fight to the ground. And so when, you know, trying to work out if, 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 if either of these guys is worth betting, the question we really need to answer is whether or not Dawson's going to be able to get his Magulov down and keep him down. And Dawson's approach to fighting is... Um, it's an interesting one. Because he's kind of a fighter that does put his eggs all in one basket. So Dawson is one of these guys that isn't a particularly good offensive wrestler. He's a very good submission grappler. And if he gets you down, he's got really good grappling control. But in terms of his actual wrestling, he's not great. And the way that he makes up for this is that he commits everything that he's got into getting you down and when someone commits everything they've got all their energy all their power and drives in really deep on your legs and hips to try and take you down it's very tough to stop it because if they're throwing everything at you it, it, they're coming at you so hard that it's really difficult to stop so Dawson's offensive wrestling technique isn't very good but he makes up for this by committing so hard to getting you down 
throwing everything that he's got at you. And that's why, if you go and watch all of his past fights, he's very successful at getting guys to the ground because he just kind of overwhelms them. The problem with that style is that when you throw everything at your opponents to try and get them to the ground, you burn through energy very, very quickly because you're not grappling with an efficient style. You're not relying on correct technique. You're, you're, you're basically relying on strength and power, which means you burn through a lot of energy, you burn your arms out very, very quickly. And so Dawson has a lot of success against these guys that haven't got the takedown defense, the balance, the athleticism, the physicality, to stuff his takedown entries or make him work hard for takedown entries and then when he ties them up on the ground they just don't have the level of grappling to deal with you know how amazing his grappling control is they can't stop him from obtaining dominant positions and when he obtains dominant positions on them they're not skilled enough to defend themselves and work their way back up to their feet so what are the kind of guys that Dawson is going to struggle against well the first kind of guy that Dawson's going to struggle against is the kind of guy with pretty good takedown defense. Because Dawson is someone that is very dangerous early in fights because when he's fresh and he's full of energy, he can generate, generate a lot of drive on his takedown entries. But if you start to stuff those takedowns, make him work hard for takedowns, if you can get him working hard for takedowns before he actually gets you down, he burns through a lot of energy in the process of trying to take his opponents down, which then makes his offensive wrestling rapidly less effective. So, for example, if you can make Dawson work really hard for takedowns in the first round, like he's committing everything he's got to taking you down, and he just can't get you down. But even if he does eventually get you down with, say, a minute and a half or two minutes left to go in the round, you've already kind of put money in the bank because the amount of energy that he's exerted getting you down early means his offensive wrestling will be much less effective in the second and third round because he doesn't have the same amount of energy to commit to the takedown. And so the first kind of guy that's going to cause Dawson big problems is someone with reasonably good takedown defense, which Damir Ismagulov has. And then the second kind of guy that is going to cause Grant Dawson a problem is the kind of guy that can prevent him from obtaining dominant positions. Grant Dawson's best position is his back take. He has slick back takes. He's very good at taking his opponents back and just controlling them for long periods of back control. And this is really important to Dawson because it's kind of like, I'm not going to call it a finishing move, but it's kind of like his speciality. He's good at taking you down, getting to your back and then controlling you for several minutes at a time from back control. And this position is really important for Dawson because while he does use a bit of energy from back control, doesn't use anywhere near as much energy as if he's having the battle to maintain top position against someone that is scrambly on the bottom or exerting energy working for takedowns. So if Dawson can get the quick takedown, get the back control pretty quickly, he can conserve energy and pace himself very well, which is why many of you watching this will probably leave a comment saying, you're a fraud, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about, Dawson doesn't slow down, what are you on about? Well, again, this is where the devil in the detail becomes very important, because you're right, in a lot of fights, Dawson doesn't slow down, his cardio looks great, but that's because in those fights where Dawson's cardio looks good, he's been allowed to pace himself, where he's been able to get the takedown, quickly get to his opponent's back, and run the clock down, score a lot of points, rack up a lot of grappling control without burning through too much energy. If you are able to make Dawson work very hard for takedowns, scramble back up to your feet when he does take you down, or prevent him from obtaining dominant positions, it's then far harder for him to pace himself. He has to burn through so much more energy to stay alive in the fight, and that's where Dawson starts to struggle. And based on past performances, Isma Gulov has good takedown defense. He's difficult to take, uh, difficult to hold down, and it's also difficult to obtain dominant positions on him. So the first thing that I want to do is show you Dawson's weaknesses with footage, and then I can show you footage of Isma Gulov, uh, the highlights how Isma Gulov is pretty well positioned 
to exploit Dawson's weaknesses. And like I said, if you're watching this on YouTube, you like these breakdown videos, you like this analysis, you want more, you can watch breakdown videos and analysis for all the prelim fights on every single UFC card on my website, mabettingtips.com, link in the description below. You'll find breakdown videos like this for all fights on there. Check it out, man. Check it out. You won't be disappointed. And uh, you'll also gain access to all my pre-fight bets as well, which as you can see earlier on, have been performing extremely well this year. So get on it. But anyway, let me show you some footage. So the first thing that I want to do is show you an example of where Dawson looks great. And a really good fight to show this is his matchup against Jared Gordon. So let me show you how Dawson is able to pace himself in a matchup such as this. So I want you to focus on how hard Dawson commits to the takedown and then how he's able to obtain dominant positions. So there you can see he drives in really deep on Gordon's legs, trying to connect his hands together. He gets him connected there and then he hits an outside trip. Well, actually he doesn't. <laughs> Gordon tries to jump on a guillotine. But either way, Dawson then passes into side control to defend the guillotine. They're back up. But when Dawson commits hard to another takedown in just a moment, and you can already see how vulnerable. I mean, look at how vulnerable Dawson is on the feet. He's a sitting duck. Very, very, very bad defensively. Ismagulov will murder this guy on the feet. But watch. Commits hard to a takedown here. Any second. Closing the distance. You can just see this guy is a sitting duck on the feet. There we go. Commit hard to a single leg. Drives through on a double. Gets it. Now. Look how he immediately takes the back. He drives through on a double leg. And Gordon tries to get to his knees. So that he can start to stand back up. And this gives Dawson an opportunity to jump on his back. He gets one hook in on the left side. Deep hook in on the right side. Immediately goes the body triangle. And as we know. Very, very difficult to work out of a body triangle, especially when you've got someone that has back control as solid as Dawson. So look at the time scale here, right? So Dawson's been able to get a takedown and back control around the midway point of round one, right? So then you can see if we skip through, he's able to maintain back control for the entire duration or for the rest of the, of the first round, basically. He just controls controls Gorton until the end of the round, right? So think about this now from a pacing point of view, okay? Dawson's had to work reasonably hard to get the takedown for the first two and a half minutes of the fight. But then in the remaining two and a half minutes of the fight, he's been able to just control Gorton from back control. Now, he will be exerting energy in this position, but he's not going to be exerting anywhere near as much energy as if he's having to scramble like crazy on the ground, battle for position, work for takedowns. So, in this position, you know, Dawson will be burning through energy, but he's also going to be able to control his breathing, his heart rate, run the clock down, score a lot of points. So, he gets two and a half minutes there to pace himself. He then gets a minute to recover in between rounds as we go into round two, right? Again, sitting duck on the feet, flat footed, bad defensively, right? Let's just skip through. You can see takedown coming any second. Shoots a double leg there or single leg there. And just upsets Gorton's balance. And again, Gorton tries to get to his knees to stand back up. Exactly the same mistake as the first round. And straight away you can see Dawson fishing for back control. This time though we're only 45 seconds into round two. So he gets one hook in on the left side, second hook in, uh, one hook in on the right side, second hook in on the left side. Starts working towards that triangle. Gordon hasn't got the energy to bridge. Now Dawson's in full back control after exerting very little energy to get this position. 
four minutes left to go in the round. And we can just skip through. And Dawson eventually tries to advance the mount, which enables Gorton to scramble back up to his feet. But then Dawson gets in on another single leg. Gets Gordon back down. And anyway. You can basically see that throughout this fight. Dawson's getting opportunities to pace himself. But towards the end of this second round. Just take a look at how sloppy Dawson looks here when they disengage. Look at how vulnerable he looks on the feet. Look how slow and sloppy he is. His mouth is wide open. His footwork is flat. Very bad defensively. You know, sitting duck to that left hand. Very, very low level. And here you can see he's just trying, trying to back up and avoid engaging. Because of how tired he is. Hand speed's very slow. But then he's able to get on another double leg. Turn the corner. And again, get the back control. So as you can see, it's been a tough, you know, tough fight for for, for uh, Dawson where he's exerted a good amount of energy. But he's also had opportunities to pace himself. And Gordon has given up a lot of takedowns very easily. I mean, here you can see Dawson going full Alistair over him. He's so tired, he's trying to run away from engaging. You see how slow his hand speed is as he, is as he steps in with his jabs. Now you can imagine what a decent striker would do to Dawson here. Anyway, here you can start to see the point I made earlier on about Dawson's offensive wrestling becoming a lot less effective. In this third round, look at how easier or how how much less drive Dawson is able to generate on the takedown entry and how much easier Gorton deals with it. Look at that. Dawson just gets nowhere near the legs this time because he's starting to get tired so he can't commit as hard to that initial shot. That initial entry. Same thing there, right? Look. Look how laboured this entry is. Look at how much higher up it is on Gorton's hips. And when you obviously shoot in slow and high above your opponent's hips like this, you give him more thinking time to dig those underhooks in play. Look at this. Look how much time and space there is for Gorton in there to stuff this takedown. Now, if he had good takedown defence, he would stuff this easily. I mean, look. Dawson... Just nowhere near as much physicality to his wrestling at this stage in the fight. Look, look, Gorton just gets his underhook here on the right side. Look how easily he neutralizes it. Look at that. So you can see Dawson has faded very, very hard here in this third round. Nowhere near as effective with his offensive wrestling. I mean, Gorton's got terrible takedown offense, so eventually gets him down. You can kind of see Dawson... Nowhere near as effective here in this third round as he was earlier. Mouth is open wide, sloppy, tired. Looking pretty awful. And we want to watch just one more fight. Damn it, I've opened the uh, Premiere by mistake and I didn't mean to. Buck, I'll turn it down, uh, turn it off now. Uh, but we don't want to form an opinion just based on one fight because obviously anyone can have an off night. So let's take a look at... The third round of Dawson versus Rick Glenn, where Dawson was forced to exert quite a lot of energy in this fight. Here we go. This is the third round. As you can see again, by the third round of this fight, Dawson's offensive wrestling just nowhere near as effective. He's tired, he's worn down. He's sloppy. Similar sort of story to Gordon. I mean, look how weak he was in that double leg takedown entry. Not the same guy, right? Look how weak he is in this position compared to earlier in the fight. Glenn can kind of just sprawl out of the takedowns easily. You know, eventually Dawson's so tired that he just decides to pull guard here. And then Glenn just smashes him from top position. But the point being, when Dawson is fresh early in a fight, 
He's very effective. But the longer the fight goes, the less effective he becomes. I mean, Glenn almost mounted him there. And so the key to beating Dawson is to make him work very hard early. So that he fades sooner in the fight. So. Is Taz Rookin the kind of guy. To neutralise the threat. Of Dawson's offensive wrestling. Keep the fight standing where we know he has a big advantage right. Even the biggest Grant Dawson fan has got to admit. He's probably in a lot of trouble if this fight stays standing. With how sloppy he looked in the footage that I just showed you. So, let's take a look at Tazrukin's takedown, uh, Isra Gulov's takedown offense. Now, remember what I said. Tazrukin's wrestling is 10 times better than Dawson's. Not only is his technique better, but his chain wrestling's better. He's more persistent. He's much better at chaining between, you know, different wrestling techniques. On top of that, Tazrukin is also got a much better gas tank than Dawson so Taz Rukian's offensive wrestling is still very effective very deep into a fight whereas we know Dawson will fade the longer the fight wears on just look at Isra Gulov's takedown defense here right Taz Rukian. oh and another thing to bear in mind is it's far harder to stuff takedowns against someone like Taz Rukian than it is someone like Dawson because Dawson doesn't have striking to set his takedowns up, right? When Dawson comes forward, because his hand speed is very slow and he doesn't have any power in his hands, his opponent has only got to focus on defending the takedown. Because they know they don't really have to worry about much when it comes to striking. Which is why, in the third round of the fights uh, against Jared Gordon and Rick Glenn, you know... Glenn and Gordon are neutralizing a lot of Dawson's takedown attempts easily. Partly because Dawson's getting tired. But also partly because now they've felt him out and got a read on him. They can see those takedown entries come a mile away because he can't set it up with striking. With Taz Rukian, because he's such a high level striker, when he comes forward, his opponents have no idea whether a head kick is coming, a spinning back fist is coming, a hook is coming, or a, a, a deep takedown attempt. Which means he has the element of surprise on his side. And it makes it far harder for him to deal with. So. Let's take a look. At Ismagulov's takedown defense. Shall we? So he's fainting a takedown there. First takedown there. So what's interesting about this takedown is. Ismagulov is actually throwing a kick when Tazrukin shoots. So he's already off balance. Because as Tazrukin shoots in on his hips and legs. He's very square to Taz Rukin. He's off balance. He's essentially on one leg. But look at how well he deals with this position. So Taz Rukin gets in. Does get taken down. But unlike Dawson. Where he exposes it. Or sorry. Unlike Gordon. Where he exposes his back to Dawson. You can see as Regulov understands the importance of protecting his back. So he keeps it very tight to the cage. And then he just focuses on clearing his legs from underneath Taz Rukin. Taz Rukian trying to go to wrist control there. But he's just pushing down on the head of Taz Rukian. Doesn't give his back up. Clears his legs. And he's back up. Now one thing that I want you to pay attention to. In this fight. Is Ismagulov's awareness. Of the threat. Taz Rukian poses to him of taking his back. Right. So. If you remember the footage of the Gordon fight, what you would see is whenever Gordon would get taken down, he would just kind of turn to his knees and just look to stand back up. Wasn't really conscious of the threat that Dawson posed to him when it came to taking his back. So what you'd see is Gordon just casually try and stand back up and there would be a lot of space in between his upper body and his thighs for Dawson to slip those hooks in play to take the back. What I want you to pay attention to in these clips is how Ismagulov is very aware of the threat of having his back taken and how to defend against that he makes sure that there's never too much space in between his upper body and his thighs and when there is it ain't there for very long and this is a really good example. If we slow this clip down you can see that what Taz Rukian wants to do is slip this left leg into the groin of 
is with Gulov's left leg so he can start to work to take the back. And then if he gets that, he's obviously going to try and slip the right leg in to the right groin of, of Isra Gulov to complete the back take, right? But Isra Gulov is doing two things here to make it very difficult. Well, actually, he's doing three things. First thing that he's doing is that he's keeping his left arm here. So if Tazrukian tries to sneak a hook in, his, le his, right, his left arm is either going to block the hook or he can push it away. The second thing he's doing is notice the position of Ismagulov's leg, right? He's kind of extending it very far out, which means if Tazrukian were to slip a hook in on the left side, it wouldn't be a tight hook because he wouldn't be able to wrap his foot around the back of Ismagulov's calf very easily. So how overextended it is. The third thing that Ismagulov is doing to make it difficult for Tazrukin to get a back take is that he's keeping his right side very, very tight to the octagon. So even if Tazrukin were to get one hook in, it would be very difficult for him to complete the back take because there's no space in there for him to get the second hook in. Now compare that to what Gordon did where he just literally... Every time he got taken down, he would just turn to his knees, expose his back, and there'd be loads of space there for Dawson to get hooks in. So you can see here, look look at the position of Tazrukin's left arm. He knows, he knows that, sorry, look at the position of Ismagulov's left arm. He knows Tazrukin wants this hook. So he just keeps that left arm there. And because of that, Tazrukin can't get the hook in. And then he just stands back up. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful defense. We'll love it. We love it. But Tazrukian's obviously still got the body lock. And he tries to upset Ismagulov's balance. But again, Ismagulov stays patient. He's got good balance himself. Never hesitates in a position for too long to enable Tazrukian to get back control. Even there, where we've got Tazrukian with one hook in. Notice how he's never at a square angle, right? When Gordon was getting taken down, notice he was um, he was at a square angle to Dawson, so Dawson could slip two hooks in. Even though Tazrukian's managed to get one hook in here, notice how Ibsen Gulov turns his body into Tazrukian, which means Tazrukian has to cover so much distance to wrap this right leg around the right side of Ibsen Gulov to get another hook in, and he can't do it. His legs aren't long enough. Because Tazrukin is just slightly turning into him. Slightly taking that angle away. So you see Tazrukin abandons the back. Taking again. Look at the underhook on this right side. From Ismagulov. Look at that underhook. Beautiful. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. And again. Pay attention to the energy that Tazrukin is exerting with his chain wrestling. Burning through a lot of energy. Do you think... Dawson could burn through this much energy trying to take Ismagulov down. I mean, look at how good Ismagulov's balance looks. Look how difficult it is to upset his balance. Now, how much energy is Dawson going to be burning through if he finds himself in a position like this with Ismagulov on top of him? Right? You know, even here, look how close Tazrukin is to getting a back take here. Right? But again, Ismagulov isn't square. Right? If Gordon was in this position against Dawson, he would be here, square to Dawson, so that Dawson could get two hooks in. Ismagulov slightly turns into him, making it difficult to get this underhook, uh, two, 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 two hooks in play. He's always taking the angle away from Tazrukin by turning into him. Look, beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, I don't, I don't know. Do I, I don't, I don't really want to make this breakdown video too long. Um, I think I made my point, but. If we skip to the third round. You can see his Regulov's cardio still pretty good in this third. You know, good head movement, good footwork. He's still light on his feet. He's not gassed at all, despite the fact that this fight's been contested at a crazy pace. He mixes things up well with his leg kicks, his boxing. Look at that. Beautiful head, head movement and footwork. And Tazrukin's a far better striker than Dawson. So here you can see Tazrukin shoots a nicely timed single leg, ducking under the left hand. Using an inside trip to get Izwagulov down. And now Izwagulov again is at risk of having his back taken. Straight away as Tazrukin tries to slip this hook in on the left side, you can see Izwagulov trying to push it away with his left arm. 
And again here, the referee kind of gets in the way, which is a little bit annoying. But if we just go back and we slow this down. Watch this. Pay attention to Ismagulov's right arm. So Tazrukian throws the left hook in there. It's not fully in. But Ismagulov has kind of got to accept that it's almost in. Right? So now that Ismagulov recognises the threat that the one hook is almost in. He immediately turns his attention to preventing Tazrukian from getting the second hook. Because he knows so long as Tazrukian doesn't get two hooks in. He's not at risk of having his back taken. So look at the... Watch. Watch this. Watch, watch, watch. So, in this position, Izbogulov recognises that he's now square to Tazrukian. So he's at greater risk of having his back taken. So look at the position of his right arm. He knows Tazrukian is going to try and slip this right hook in here on the inside of his groin. And look how he defends with the right arm. Watch. Look at that elbow there. As he senses Tazrukian's right arm comes... Notice how he brings the elbow down to block it. And as a result, Tazrukian can't get the hook in. Notice the difference between Jared Gordon and Ismagulov. So now, Tazrukian's got one hook in on the left side, a nice deep hook. But he can't get the second hook in. Look at that. Look at that. Now he gets the second hook in there. But then look. Look at the difference here. Tazrukian immediately... Sorry, Izbogulov immediately starts to fight off the hooks with his legs. Can you see this? Watch. He, give, he accepts that Tazrukian's got two hooks in. Rolls to his back. And immediately starts trying to free these hooks up by turning into Tazrukian to take the angle away from him. Just like when he's always turning into him when defending takedowns. Notice how he starts trying to turn to his left to loosen those hooks up. See how he's turning? Turns to his front. And again. Back in a position where it's difficult to get ta difficult for Tazrukin to get those hooks back. Same old story. And this is in the third round of the fight, right? When this fight's been contested at a crazy pace. Isra Gulov is tired. He's worn down. Is Dawson still going to be able to persist with the takedowns? The offensive wrestling like this. In the same way that Tazrukian can deep into this fight, right? Isra Gulov's takedown offense, defensive wrestling looks absolutely brilliant in my opinion. So we don't want to make it too long. But I think you get my point. So, to bring this full circle, I have absolutely no idea why Isra Gulov is even many here. I'd have Isra Gulov as like a 1.40 minus 250 favorite. If I was capping this fight. Shout out to everyone betting Dawson. Who has improved the odds on Isma Gulov for us. Um, this is a very very good stylistic matchup for Isma Gulov. The footage I've just shown you shows. Isma Gulov has the takedown offense and the defensive wrestling. To make Dawson work very hard for takedowns. Keep a good percentage of this fight standing. And based on what you've seen. We know Isma Gulov has a really big advantage on the feet. So. Hopefully. We can keep this winning streak going. Shout out to Randy Brown who came through for us big time last week. Hopefully we can keep this nice streak going. And bank another bet this weekend. I absolutely love a bet on Demir Ismagulov this weekend. And like I say, it doesn't mean he's going to win. Anything can happen in MMA. But I do feel if you're betting Ismagulov this weekend, you are overwhelmingly stacking the odds in your favour. Not financial advice, not a financial advisor, gamble responsibly, do your own research and all that good stuff. But um, if you're looking for a bet this weekend, take a look at Isra Gulov, do your own research and I have a feeling you'll find the same things I found. So in terms of the over-under on this one, we can see that um, the bookies believe this fight's more likely to go to a decision. I... I do get where they're coming from, right? I do get where they're coming from. Because if you look at Isra Gulov's record, he's an absolute decisionator, right? He doesn't have the killer instinct. He's not really a finisher. He's more of a volume striker, you know, than, than a dangerous power striker, right? You can see that, you know, every single one of his fights over the last five years has gone to a decision. You know, only one of his last... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Uh, eight, nine. Only one of his last nine has ended inside the distance. If you look at Dawson's record, 
obviously, you know, he has had some late finishes, but all three of those finishes were very, very close to um, going to a decision, right? This fight, one second away from going to a decision. This fight, 49 seconds away from going to a decision. So for that reason, I understand why this fight... The, the odds are as steep as this on fight to go to a decision, right? Um, both guys are very tough as well. Not easy to get either of them out of there. What I would say is that... I think Ismagulov can make Dawson work far harder for takedowns than anyone Dawson's faced in the UFC so far. So I could see a situation in this fight, which is reasonably likely, where Dawson can't get Ismagulov down early burns himself out trying to get the fight to the ground, is then forced to stand and strike for a long time with Ismagulov and ends up getting to the point where he's too tired to defend himself on the feet and ultimately gets knocked out. I think that's a reasonably likely outcome. So I would not bet this. Even though I do think it's more likely the fight would go to a decision, I wouldn't bet this as steep favourite odds. I would pass on this. Um, in terms of prop bets on this fight... Um, is Magulov by decision the odds are terrible so I wouldn't go for that um, a, a prop bet that does interest me on this one is is Magulov the win in round 3 the odds of like 20.0 plus 1900 simply because like I say if is Magulov can make Dawson work very hard for takedowns with how bad of a striker Dawson is we could see a situation where Dawson's just too tired to defend himself late in the fight. And then Ismagulov gets a finish. So I quite like that. And you guys know me. I'm not the biggest fan of props. I don't bet them myself. So if you're the kind of guy that likes to sprinkle a little bit of money on every fight to make watching him more interesting. Um, you know. Ismagulov to win in round three. I think it gives you a pretty good risk to reward ratio. He's not super likely to win. But when you place bets in that odds range, you don't need a particularly high win rate to make a good profit long term. So I hope you found that useful. Let me know what you think in the comments below, man. Um, if you're betting on Ismagulov, if you're betting on Dawson. If you think I missed anything, if you disagree. If you like that breakdown, um, please hit the like button as well. Try and help me get some more views on this video. I would really appreciate it. So now let's break down the next fight on this card, which is going to be Max Griffin versus Michael Morales. So, we start off by taking a look at the odds. We can see that Morales is the favourite at odds of 1.40, which is minus 250 for an implied probability of 71%. We take a look at the odds on Griffin. He's around an average of 3.10, which is going to be plus 210 for an implied probability of 32%. So Morales is 24 years old, 6 foot tall, with a 79 inch reach. And Griffin is 37 years old, 5 foot 11, with a 76 inch reach. So, a couple of X factors for us to pay attention to here. The first being the age of Max Griffin. So he is 6, uh, he's 13 years older than Morales. And we know statistically that the younger fighter wins around 70% of the time, 7-0, when there is a 13 age gap in a fight. And I do think Griffin in his last few fights has shown signs of a decline. You know, he slowed down a little bit in his last couple of fights as the fight has worn on. And Griffin built his career off having a great gas tank, being able to fight at a really high pace. So now that his gas tank is starting to let him down in these later years... He's nowhere near as effective as he used to be. And so, you know, while the odds are pretty steep on Morales, what's interesting is, you know, statistically with the age gap, we know he's got about a 70% chance of winning over the long term. And that is pretty much exactly where the implied probability is on his odds. So that tells you something. Um, Morales has also got a slight height and reach advantage over Griffin nothing major but there is a big difference in you know athleticism physicality here so this is an interesting fight because when I look at this fight it's 
kind of similar to Ilya, Lot- Ilya Topuria versus Josh Emmett last week. Where if you go back and watch my breakdown video for that fight, you'll see that, you know, I say if you watch the footage of both guys, there were lots of things that Josh Emmett could do to cause Ilya Topuria a big problem, Right? And the week before, we said there were lots of things Marvin Vittori could do to cause Jared Cannonier a big problem, right? Where you got younger guys like Tapuria and Vittori fighting older guys like Emma and Cannonier. And you saw Cannonier destroy Vittori. And you saw Tapuria destroy Emma. So one and one on that logic over the last two weeks, right? This is a similar sort of situation where... There are a lot of things that Mike that, that Max Griffin can do to cause Michael Morales a problem. But like we said in the Canonier Vittori breakdown and the Topuria Emmett breakdown, it's a very hard trend to fight against. Where you wanna bet on the older guy. In a matchup where we know statistically they lose 70% of the time. It's a lot easier to push a boulder down a mountain than it is up a mountain, right? You want to be betting with a strong trend, not against one. Because when you win with if you bet with a strong trend, right? If you just know absolutely nothing about MMA and you blind bet every single fight, or you bet on every single young guy. When they face a guy 10 years older than them. Or more. 10 years older or more. You know even if you know nothing about the sport. You're going to win 70% of the time. Right. You could train a monkey to do that. Right. Why would you want to put yourself in a position. Where you're trying to cherry pick. The 30% of fights. Where a guy like Jared Kananier is an exception to the rule and breaks that trend. So when I get fights like this and I research them and I identify in the footage that there's lots of things Griffin can do to cause Morales a problem, rather than fight the trend, I just walk away and I do nothing and I find stronger positions for me to put my money you know, on guys like Isma Gulov, guys like Randy Brown last week or Jasmine Jazz Duvisius the week before. Right? Now... In terms of how they match up from a stylistic point of view, I've said that Griffin can do a few things to cause Morales a problem. What are those things? Well, Morales is a powerful, physically imposing, athletic fighter. But at 24 years old, he is still very green, right? At 24 years old, you're young, you're inexperienced, you're going to have weaknesses. There's no way at 24 years old you're going to be the complete article and you're not going to have some pretty major weaknesses. Morales is no different. So on the feet, striking is quite sloppy. He's very bad defensively. So from a technical point of view, while Morales may have more power than Griffin, and he might be more athletic than Griffin, he's nowhere near as good technically. Griffin has better footwork, better movement, better defense, throws a higher volume of strikes and more diverse range of strikes. So Griffin has a pretty good chance of causing Morales problems on the feet. (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. Quick drink of water. Oh, God. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Something in my throat. <coughs> okay. So, on the feet, Griffin stands a good chance of causing Morales some problems. But Morales' takedown offense and ground game is also pretty bad. If you go back and watch his past fights, guys have got him down, held him down pretty easily. Now, Griffin's grappling isn't good. You know, Griffin's takedown offense and ground game is also his weakness. But it's also a weakness in Morales that we've got to call out. So this is right. Ugh, throat. My God. All right. And I've gone a bit blurry as well. There we go. So this is one of those fights where... I think Griffin can have success both standing up and on the ground. 
but I'm just not interested in betting him because I know whenever I bet on an older guy against a guy 13 years younger than them, it's like pushing a boulder up a mountain. You can make this game as easy for yourself or as hard for yourself as you want it to be, right? I'd much prefer to wait for those situations like is with Gulov, where we overwhelmingly stack the odds in our favour and we're pushing the boulder down the mountain. And when we do that, that's how we end up with charts that look like this. This period here over the last year. And also, charts that look like this. Our live betting performance where we barely ever have a losing month. It's non-stop profits. Every quarter pretty much. So, what does that mean from a betting point of view? It means, in my opinion, you'd have to be crazy to bet Michael Morales at these odds. Because, from a technical point of view, I don't think he really has any advantages over Griffin. Like, he's not a better striker, he's not a better grappler, really. What Morales does have on his side is cardio, athleticism and power. And because Griffin's takedown offence isn't great and he fades a lot as fights wear on, if Morales does come into this fight with a grappling heavy game plan, he's more than likely going to be able to overwhelm Griffin with his physicality. But, I don't like Morales enough in this fight to bet him as a big favourite because if I, th I because I think if he doesn't use a grappling heavy game plan if he tries to stand and strike with Griffin I think Griffin can have a lot of success so I'm not going to be betting this fight because I don't like to bet against the really strong trend but if you're going to bet this fight this weekend I would go dog or pass I think it's Griffin or pass I think you'd be crazy to bet on Morales in this odds range because there's just very little risk to reward very poor risk to reward, sorry. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Now, in terms of the over-under on this one, that is in the even money odds range. And that's interesting because if you look at Morales' record, went to a decision on the Contender Series, almost went to a decision in his last fight. We know that Griffin is a decisionator. His last three have gone to a decision. Most of his fights in the UFC have gone to a decision. I'm not going to be betting the over-under on this one myself just because Griffin is really bad on the ground. So if Morales does come in with a grappling heavy game plan, I think he overwhelms Griffin on the ground, drowns him and gets him out of there. But if Morales comes out trying to win a kickboxing match like he usually does, Griffin's pretty tough, pretty difficult to put away. We've seen him rocked, wobbled, dropped, hurt plenty of times in fights and he's done a pretty good job of hanging in there. So I do see, I do, do think it's pretty likely the fight goes to a decision. I'm not going to be betting the over under myself, but if I were to bet it, I do think this fight is more likely to go to a decision. Just because Morales likes to stand and bang, and it ain't easy to put Griffin away. I mean, his record shows that, right? Um, has he ever been knocked out? He's had almost 30 pro fights, and he's never been knocked out. And he's only been stopped twice by Colby on the ground and Matt Secor on the ground as well. So never been knocked out in 30 pro fights. Will Morales be the first to do it? Who knows? <coughs> oh, man. Something in my throat. God damn. Sorry, guys. Jesus. All right. Fuck me. All right, prop bets. Um, there's no real props I like on this one. Um, Morales by decision is the only one that would interest me, but the odds are pretty steep, so I would give that one a miss. Um, the odds are a bit dead on, uh, on props there. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Now let's break down the next fight on this card, which is going to be Ariane Lipsky against Melissa Gatto. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Gatto is a reasonably big favourite, at average odds of about 1.42, which is going to be minus 238 for an implied probability of 70%. 
if we take a look at the odds on Lipsky, she's around an average of 2.85, which is going to be plus 185 for an implied probability of 35%. So Lipsky, 29 years old, 5 foot 9 with a 67 inch reach. And Gatto, 27 years old, 5 foot 5 with a 69 inch reach. So both girls roughly the same age, roughly the same size, even from the same country. And they both have a base in Muay Thai. So a lot of similarities between these two. So why is Gatto pretty big favorite here? So the reason why Gatto is a pretty big favorite is because Lipsky's takedown the fence and ground game has looked really bad in the past. And while Gatto's ground game isn't great, you know, she's pretty weak off her back, gives up cheap takedowns, and her ground game's not amazing. You know, this is one of those situations where for me, in past fights, Gato's ground game has looked good enough to the extent that I think she can cause Lipsky big problems on the ground. Now, if the fight stays standing, I actually give Lipsky the edge. She's very aggressive, throws a high volume of strikes, and Gato doesn't throw as high a volume of strikes, and she's not as technical or aggressive as, as Lipsky. Um, she might be a bit better defensively than Lipsky, but offensively, Lipsky is, is better than Gatto on the feet. But, Lipsky's takedown offense has looked really bad in the past. And in all of Gatto's past fights in the UFC, she's shown a willingness to want to grapple. So you'd expect her to try and take Lipsky to the ground. And if she does try to use a grappling heavy game plan, and if she does get Lipsky to the ground, she's likely to do very well. Now, Lipsky is an interesting one. Because throughout the majority of her fights in the UFC, her takedown offense was non-existent. The strongest the wind would be enough to take her down. She was very low level on the ground, right? Very weak off her back. Very bad submission defense. Lipsky is the kind of fighter that, you know, if you put her on her back, she's like Gabriela Fernandez a few weeks ago in, against Teresa Blader. She would literally lie on her back and do absolutely nothing. But in her last fight against JJ Aldrich, she did show potential improvements because in that matchup, Aldrich spanned takedowns for 15 minutes and Lipsky flawlessly stuffed every single takedown and Aldrich didn't really get near a takedown. So that is you know, a sign that Lipsky's takedown offense is definitely improving. You know, A takedown offense against Aldrich looked exponentially better than it had in the past and that's going to make it more difficult for Melissa Gatto to get this fight to the ground. The problem though is going back to what I talked about in the Taz Rukian versus Dawson breakdown where Aldrich came into this fight with a very predictable game plan even though Aldrich is primarily a striker she didn't use striking in that fight to set her takedowns up she tried to stay all the way outside the range where she could be hit and then when she did come forward and close the distance every time she closed the distance she looked for a takedown instead of throwing strikes which meant that Lipsky was able to get a read on her. And every single time Aldrich changed levels and came forward, Lipsky saw it coming from a mile away and was able to clear her legs and uh, step the takedown before Aldrich even got near uh, upsetting her, her balance by getting it on her legs and hips. Gatto has got far better striking than Aldrich. You know, she's got a base in Muay Thai, whereas Aldrich has got a base in boxing. So Gatto throws a much more diverse range of strikes she can do a much better job of setting up her takedowns than Aldrich. And she's also a lot more physically imposing than Aldrich. So she does stand a far greater chance of getting Lipsky to the ground than Aldrich did. And like I say, outside of the JJ Aldrich fight, Lipsky's takedown offense has looked an absolute joke. And on the ground, very, very low level. I mean, we can see it here, right? Two losses via ground and pound. Where she's just been, you know too vulnerable on the ground to defend herself. I mean, when you're getting stopped on the ground by someone like Antonina Shevchenko, it speaks volumes, right, for how bad your ground game is. And of course, she has improved a lot in the last three years, but old habits die hard. And I think if Gatto gets her down, puts her in some bad positions, Gatto is going to have a lot of success. And that's why she's the favourite here. So from a betting point of view, it is a bit dead because... From my perspective, Gato is too big of a favourite to bet at these odds. You're just not getting a good risk to reward ratio in this odds range because Gato tends to give up position on the ground a lot and Lipsky's takedown offence has improved a lot. 
So if Gatto can't get the fight to the ground, I give Lipsky the edge on the feet. So in order to be betting someone in this odds range, ideally you wouldn't want them to have any major weaknesses that their opponent could potentially exploit. And with the fact that Gatto gives up position a lot and is probably second best when it comes to striking, she's just not the kind of fighter that I'd be betting in this odds range. So Gatto is an easy pass for me. On the flip side, I wouldn't be betting Lipsky as an underdog either because we know she's very weak off her back. We know her submission defense is very bad. So if Gatto can get her down, she's likely to cause her a lot of problems on the ground. Why place bets on fighters like Ariane Lipsky when you can get your money into super strong positions like Damir Ismagulov this weekend? I'm not saying Ismagulov will win. All I'm saying is based on past performances and fight research, uh, Ismagulov is, is a very strong position to put your money. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I see this fight from a money line point of view. In terms of the over-under, this one is very tricky. We know the majority of women's MMA fights go to a decision. However, styles make fights. And when you look at what these two bring to the table, Lipsky is the queen of violence. She is very aggressive on the feet, puts a lot of pressure on her opponents, and really takes the fight to them and forces them to engage, which increases the probability of a stoppage on the feet. On the ground, we know Lipsky is very bad at defending herself. And we know Gatto is very aggressive on the ground with ground the pound and also uh, attacking with submissions. And so for that reason, this is one of those women's MMA fights which I do think is reasonably likely to end inside the distance. Um, I don't really have an opinion on it either way. I don't feel confident either way. I don't lean or favour the over under either way. I'm going to pass on this. Um, I think the odds are probably where they should be. I think the odds are probably where they should be. Uh, in terms of the props on this one. Um, yeah, there's nothing I really like. There's nothing I really like. Gato is very tough, so Lipsky by knockout of TKO isn't that likely. And I think it's if the fight did go to the ground, it's kind of equally likely that Gatto would get a win by submission or ground and pound um, which obviously means you'd have to bet Gatto to win by submission and Gatto to win by knockout or TKO to cover both those outcomes which dramatically cuts down on the risk to reward you're getting you know the odds on Gatto inside the distance are terrible so yeah props a bit dead I'd give them a miss. So I hope you found that useful. I need another drink. My God, my throat. Is, I've been talking for a long time. So because it's so hot here in the UK with it being in the summer, it's just, my throat's very dry and I'm running out of water rapidly. Let's try and get through this video, man. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Anything happening on Discord? Nice. <laughs> nice one, Jody, bro. Um, is Magulov wants an easy fight against Gaethje? I think he would be a nightmare for Gaethje, actually. I think he would be a nightmare. Anyway, now let's break down the fight between Benoit Sandeni. How is my French? The God of War. Uh, do you think he's a Greek mythology fan or a PlayStation fan? Probably a bit of both. He's fighting Moretta. Don't know what that means in Portuguese, but it's Ishmael Bonfim. One half of the Bonfim bros. All right, let's break it down. So if we start off by looking at the odds on this one, we can see that Bonfim is quite a big favorite. One of the biggest favorites on the card, the average odds of about 1.30, which is going to be minus 333 for an implied probability of 77%. We take a look at the odds on Sandeni. He is around an average of 3.50, which is going to be plus 250 for an implied probability of 29%. Very interesting fight this, which is why I'm disappointed I ran out of water because my throat is causing me problems. <coughs> Sandeni, 27 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 73 inch reach. Ishmael Bonfin, 27 years old, 5 for 8, with a 71 inch reach. So we can see that both guys the same age. 
Sandeni a little bit longer and taller. But what Bonfin lacks in height and reach, he makes up for in power and physicality. He's got that small, compact, muscular frame, which comes with its own benefits. So this is a really interesting fight. Because from a technical point of view, Bonfin probably has the edge everywhere. However, there aren't many guys in the UFC which are going to bring Hellfire and Brimstone in the same way as the God of War. And unless you've seen guys like Bonfin dragged into the depths of hell, into a crazy brawl, into a crazy war, you don't really know how they're going to react. So a really good example of how this fight might get very tricky for Bonfin is Sandini's debut against Elizu uh, Zaleski dos Santos. Now to the naked eye, if you watch that fight, Sandini got absolutely destroyed, which he did. He took a life-changing amount of damage. He probably took 10 years off his life with that fight, right? The fucking referee should be arrested for attempted murder for not stopping that fight. However, what that fight did show is the sand and he's tough as nails and he's the kind of guy that you have to practically kill in order to beat. What that fight also showed is that no matter what you do to sand any, no matter how hurt he is, no matter how tired he is, he's still going to keep coming forward and try to kill you. That's just the type of dude he is. And that's really difficult to deal with, right? When you've knocked your opponent down three times, You've cut them up, you've injured them, you've battered the legs with leg kicks, you've gone to the body, you've lit them up on the feet, and they just keep coming. They won't go away. A lot of guys can kind of panic and freak out because it's demoralizing to throw everything you've got at your opponent, your best shots, only to see them keep coming forward. You know, guys like Tony Ferguson, guys like Nate Diaz, guys like Justin Gaethje, they built a career of toughness, right? Just coming forward, applying relentless pressure to their opponents, soaking up everything that their opponents would throw at them, and just having that never say die, no quit attitude. And, you know, Justin Gaethje, Tony Ferguson, Nate Diaz, they were never the most skilled fighters in their divisions. But all three guys were able to consistently compete at the highest level of the sport because their toughness made them a difficult challenge for most guys in the division. Now I'm not putting Sandeni at the same level as those guys. But what I am saying is that the toughness of Sandeni does present a problem for almost anyone in the division that is challenging. And that less experienced fighters like Ishmael Bonfin can struggle against. Now look. He's had 21 pro fights. I understand this guy's not a rookie. He is experienced. But how much experience does he have facing a crazy Frenchman that's going to walk him down, covered in blood, trying to rip his face off? And no matter what you do to him, he just keeps coming forward. So that's where this fight gets interesting because if you look at it from a stylistic point of view, it's a pretty good fight for Bonfin. Because on the feet, Bonfin hits a lot harder than Sandeni. He's a lot more technical than Sandini. You know, one of the reasons why Sandini ran into so much trouble against uh, Dos Santos is because Sandini is very bad defensively. He takes a lot of damage on the feet. We know Bonfin has got big power in his hands, big knockout power. So he can cause Sandini a lot of trouble on the feet. But if Sandini keeps coming forward, keeps forcing Bonfin to exchange, do we start to see Bonfin tire out and wear down? Because very few guys could keep up with the pace that Sandini sets. And when it comes to grappling, we don't really know a lot about Bonfin's takedown offense and ground game. Sandini's offensive wrestling looks great. His grappling looks pretty good. He hasn't really faced much high-level opposition. Has really tested his grappling. But from what we've seen, Sandini shows flashes of really good grappling. But for me, Bonfin's grappling is a bit more of an unknown. He has had a lot of fights. He does have a decent amount of wins by submission. But... A lot of his past fights are against a very low level of opponent. You know, 3-2, and 7-7, and 4-2, and 3-3, and 9-5. And, and so I am finding it difficult to assess Bonfin's level on the ground. Because he's not really facing much of a test or a challenge. 
It's not facing guys we could take down a fence or guys that can cause him problems on the ground. You know, they're giving up takedowns pretty easily and they're, uh, you know, they're allowing Bonfin to just kind of dominate him on the ground, you know, pretty easily. And so, yeah, man, it's one of those situations where, it's one of those situations where, um, you know, it's very, very difficult to know what to expect. Because we don't really know how Bonfin's going to deal with someone like Sandeni who is absolutely relentless. So it's an interesting fight. What does all that mean from a betting point of view? Well, in my opinion, you would have to be a crazy person to bet on Bonfin in this odds range. Because the odds are 1.30 minus 333. Applied probability is 77%. You're just not getting a good risk to reward ratio on Bonfin. In my opinion. Very, very bad odds. Very bad odds. Um, if you really want to bet this fight. Which I wouldn't recommend. But if you do. In my opinion it's dog or pass. You've got to take Sandini or nothing at all. On the hope that his toughness. His work rate. His relentless style of fighting. Will break Bonvin down. And wear him down. But who knows. Who knows. Now. In terms of the over-under on this one, obviously Sandeni likes to bring absolute war. Very, very aggressive. You know, Bonvin's got big power on the feet. Sandeni's aggressive on the feet and on the ground. And because Sandeni is constantly forcing guys to engage, you'd have to say the fight not to go to a decision is more likely. Uh, I'm probably not going to bet him myself because the odds are quite steep. But there's no way that I would bet the over on a fight like this because Sandini just brings too much violence to bet the over. You know, he's so bad defensively, but he's so aggressive that a finish could come at any time. So I think it's more likely the fight ends inside the distance, but the odds are too steep for me to go with it. In terms of props, um, I actually really like Sandini to win by knockout at TKO. Our odds are 13.0. Uh, plus 1,200, just based on the fact that Sandeni might be able to wear Bonfin down to the point where Bonfin becomes too tired to defend himself because he can't keep up with the pace Sandeni sets, and then Sandeni could get a stoppage by ground and pound or when Bonfin's too tired to defend himself on the feet. So I do think there's some value there. I won't be betting it myself. I don't like betting props, but those, those odds are definitely wide for me with how aggressive sand than he is especially in a fist fight to the death so i hope you found that breakdown video useful let me know what you think in the comments below now let's break down the next fight which is going to be nur sultan rozibiev against bruno ferreira possibly butchered the pronunciation of both these gentlemen's names bruno with the two ends rozibiev uh, don't know how you pronounce that Anyway, let's take a look at the odds. So we can see that Bruno Ferreira, a uh, pretty big favourite. Average odds of about 1.44, which is going to be minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. We take a look at the odds on Rozibiev, Rozibuev, Rozibuev. Please let me know how bad I'm buttering his name in the comments. He's around an average of 2.80, which is going to be plus 180 for an implied probability at 36%. So Rozibov, 29 years old, 6 foot 4, reach unknown. And Ferreira, 30 years old, 5 foot 10, with a 72 inch reach. So this is one of those fights where I would keep a close eye on the weigh-ins. Because it looks like Rozibov may have a big size and reach advantage here. 6 foot 4 versus 5 foot 10 means that these guys could look a weight class apart. Ruzibov may have a huge size advantage, might absolutely tower over Ferreira. Um, you know, it, it might not make too much of a difference because different body types have different strengths and weaknesses. Ruzibov, you look at his past fights, he's very lean, lanky, tall. Ferreira, small, compact, muscular. So obviously Ferreira is a lot more powerful, a lot more physically imposing than Ruzibov. Every body type has different strengths and weaknesses. But when it comes to betting, for me, this is an impossible fight to bet. Um, there just isn't enough 
good quality footage on either guy to form a strong opinion on this fight. If we start with Ferreira, he's had 10 pro fights. But if we look at his record, um, every single one of them has ended very quickly. He's never been to a decision. He's only been past the first round twice in his career. And both those fights ended very quickly. So, for me, Ferreira is pretty much a complete unknown. We've got no idea what his cardio is like. No idea how he's going to look going into the second and third rounds. All we've got to base an opinion on is, you know, a bunch of fights where he's got to finish very quickly, for the most part, against a pretty low level of opponent before he fought Gregory Rodriguez. So for me, I don't have a strong opinion on Ferreira. What we know about him is he's very small, compact, muscular, likes to come forward, get into big exchanges and look to knock you out. That's what he likes to do. Past that, don't know very much about him. There just isn't that much footage. Rudiboev has had loads of fights, especially for a 29-year-old. But you know what? We don't really know a lot about him either, despite the fact there's a lot more footage available on him. This is because if you look at his record, similar sort of story to Ferreira. A lot of quick finishes. Round one, 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 round one. Round one. So you've got to go all the way back to 2019, four years ago, to see the last time he went to a decision. And he didn't look good in this fight at all. Takedown offense was awful. Ground game very low level. However, he only would have been, you know, 25 back when this fight took place. So he could have improved a lot since then. The problem is, we don't know how much he's improved because all his fights since then have ended so quickly. So, Ruziboev, pretty much a complete unknown. Um, if he shows up and performs like he did in 2018, very tough fight for him. But, probably improved a lot in the last four years. And so, kind of makes his fight impossible for betting. Easy pass, boys. Easy pass. Based on Ruziboev's past performances, he's got bad takedown offense, not great on the ground. Um, he's quite aggressive on the feet, but he's kind of long and tall and lanky, so not the best offensively. Um, but I don't really have an opinion on this fight because of a lack of footage on both guys. This is one of those matchups where what we need to hope for is that this fight goes the distance. Is a back and forth war of attrition where we get to learn a bit about the, both guys striking, a little bit about their grappling, how they look in the second and third round. And then the next time we see these two guys fight, um, we'll know a lot more about them and be in a much stronger position. Hopefully make some money and bet their fights. So I hope you found that useful. Um, needless to say, if you want to bet this fight, you got to go Rozeboev. Um, you'd be crazy to bet on a guy like Ferreira at big favourite odds when we've never even seen him really go past round one. For all we know, he could gas very bad in the second. So this is dog or pass for me. The risk to reward ratio on Ferreira is just very, very bad without knowing too much about these two. Um, and because we don't really know anything about these two, uh, difficult to feel confident on the over under or any prop so all across the board this fight is a total pass and i hope you found that useful thank you very much for watching everyone love you all don't forget man free trials going out for live betting this weekend if you want to join email me my address is in the description below have a great week hope you crash it hope you make loads of money please like subscribe follow post comments all that good shit makes all this more worthwhile thank you very much for watching take care everyone i'll see you all very soon nice one guys bye